like an arrow you fall back before we spring ahead like a sparrow we must fall before we fly again and like the ocean we hold all our secrets within and then we hurricane and we make it rain all the thoughts we kept hidden we hold all the world sorrow and pride keep all the culture and history inside and when everything starts to look wrong then we will turn pain to love, yeah, and our minds they grow, and our hearts they flow, and nobody knows just what art can do, and we can change the world, but you're in the world too. You must let art change you. <laughs> we hold all the world, sorrow and pride. Keep all the culture and history inside. And when everything starts to look rough, we turn that pain to love. And all the arts, whether new or old, there is a story that wants to be told. And when that story reaches more than enough, then we'll turn pain to love. We will paint our Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Alexis Maxwell, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm an arts advocate because I believe arts can change the world. And I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects me with joy and with hope for the future. My name is Brian Boyles, I'm from Northampton, and I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects me with our past and helps us imagine our future. My name is Justina Crawford from Boston, and I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects me to communities who inspire me to be bold. I'm Lynn Nichols from Gill. And I'm an arts ad advocate because creativity connects me to traditions, both past and new. <laughs> Sorry for the false start. My name is Lauren Wolk. I'm from Centerville. And I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects me to my very best self. My name is Declan McDermott from North Adams, and I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects me to the culture and lives of those around me. With Arts Emerson and Hal Round, who's live streaming, and I'm from Milton, Massachusetts, and I'm an arts advocate because creativity connects us to our common humanity, our common humanity. Welcome everybody to Mass Creative's Creating Connects Arts Advocacy Day. Very good. Here we are. Thank you, Alexis, for your wonderful performance. Alexis is here with us from Bar Boston Arts Academy, one of the most robust and comprehensive arts programs in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Let's give her a hand. 
It is great to see all of you here in the beautiful Paramount Center. I'll be your MC for the morning as we kick off Arts Advocacy Day. Sound like a plan? Yeah. So how many of you were here two years ago when we, I can't actually see you, but that's okay. You're here. How many of you were here two years ago when we were here celebrating? Yes, great. So you know that we have a, a good time as we spend this day together, really celebrating all the things that we care about uh, so deeply. Um, it said that service is the rent that we pay to live on this earth. And I, like many of you, have chosen arts as my service. I personally dedicated, yes, that's right. I personally dedicated my life's work to leveraging arts to connect us more deeply to each other. And it's as if Maya Angelou were speaking for me when she said, and I quote, I believe in all of my work and in everything I do that we as humans are more alike than we are unalike. And to use this statement to tear down the walls that we build between ourselves because we are different, end quote. And so I am here because I believe that arts has a power, is a powerful tool to connecting us here. That's mine to do, but what's ours to do? We can build connections that only arts can actually do. We have a role to play. Through our good work, we can make clear the task to address the many issues that impact our communities. At Arts Emerson, we made a commitment several years ago to be a part of a citywide effort to foster civic transformation around race. That's the work that we do. A lot of the work that we put into the world reflects that commitment. Again, that's Arts Emerson's to do, but what's ours to do together? Whatever your work is, we should be doing it together in consort with one another, like we're doing here today, coming together as a sector to flex our muscles, to show our political leaders that we, as arts and arts community, really matter in the state of Massachusetts. So I am uh, your official traffic cop, and you'll see me throughout the entire day. I will um, encourage you to move along. I will encourage you to take your seats or find your group. So you will bear with me as I bear with you. Um, so um, I hope you won't tire of me. I want to go through our agenda for today. So please pull out your goldenrod sheet and follow along my goldenrod sheet that I left backstage. But you have yours. Wave it high. Yes. We will spend the morning celebrating you members of the arts and cultural community. We will share stories about the arts and cultural community's impact across the Commonwealth, and we'll give you everything you need to be an effective arts advocate at the State House. Then we will march across Boston Common to the State House for meetings with legislators and gather together for a debrief. This year, we want to keep the celebration going, so we hope you'll join us for an after party at Democracy Brewery, where we can share our day's successes together. Yes? Are you still with me? Great. See, I like to know that you're alive and well, so you know, a little hoots and hollers every now and then really help keep mo things moving. So please take out your phone. We know everyone, most everyone has one. Take out your phone. Before we move on to the next part of the agenda, Rachel Bird, Mass Creative's campaign organizer, and I want us all to tell the outside world what is happening here today. So I want everyone to use the phone and take a minute to write a post with a picture with hashtag creativity connects. Feel free to use Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And if you're not on social media, get in a friend's photo and add your name to it. So I'm gonna take a picture of all of you. So I just need a little, few house lights up here. And while I'm taking a picture of you, you do your hashtags and post to social media, yes? Okay. You can talk amongst yourselves as you do this. Okay. No, I can't see anything. All right. Excellent. So, oh, so I have to post it. So, hashtag creativity connects. This will take me a second. On Twitter, yes. Okay. Uh huh. If I knew how to work my Twitter. Okay. I 
I think last year, or two years ago, we were like trending. We were doing quite well. So let's try and keep that going this year. Let's see if it works. Is it, is it supposed to work? Do you see your tweets up there? Are they coming? They're coming, yes. All right, is that, as you keep going, um, oh, do you see something? Oh yeah, there you go, that's me right there, see? Creativity connects. You do it. Make sure you tweet and post throughout the day here at the Paramount in the March and after the legislative meetings. You will see handles for speakers on the agenda and for legislators on the meeting list to include in your posts. For every one of us who are here, there are thousands who share our passion and know that arts matter to all of us here in the Commonwealth. Yes? Are you still tweeting? Okay, great. Now we're going to keep going as you tweet. So pay attention and tweet at the same time. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce um, Lee Pelton, the president of Emerson College, to share a few remarks with us. Uh, yes, I did tweet. So. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you? So it's uh, a real pleasure for me to be here with so many artists and art patrons and local supporters and staunch advocates for the arts and arts education. And I want to thank Matt Wilson and all the people at Mass Creative who were involved in making today happen. And of course, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, and from Emerson, I want to recognize David Howes, uh, uh, who just spoke, and those at Arts Emerson and, and HowlRound, as well as the Elma Lewis Center for Civic Engagement learning and research uh, in Emerson stage for their role in today's events. You know, Emerson is well known for excellence in the arts, the communication, and the liberal arts. We educate young artists and communicators to become a creative force in the diverse fields that shape our culture and our society. But it's not enough to prepare educated uh, citizens for the 21st century, we must prepare educated and engaged citizens, as you heard from David earlier, for the 21st century. And we take seriously our responsibility as a leader in the community and, and the world. And we pursue this vision by embracing excellence, diversity, inclusion, co-joined with global and civic engagement. Um, we uh, partner with various uh, community organizations to support artists uh, and art projects in the city, including, for example, uh, among a few, the Asian Community Development Corporation, Artists for Humanities, the Real Abilities Film Festival, and the Boston Poetry Festival. And the last two poet laureates, by the way, are in, in the city are graduates of Emerson College. There you go, I like that. Um, our Elma, Elma Lewis Center inspires engagement and action by using the college's strengths and the communication and the arts to support social change. And we are very proud of the work happening at our engagement lab, which is the innovation hub focused on civic media. For instance, our researchers are currently working on uh, working to develop and proto prototype smart city technology through the several local communities. And Emerson is likewise committed to public arts programming through Emerson's Urban Arts Media Art Gallery, which is located here on uh, Avery Street. And if you haven't been there, I suggest that you go see it. Uh, it's just around the corner from us. Uh, indeed, an Emerson education is an education rooted in creativity, in critical thinking, in collaboration, uh, and in communication. Uh, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, those four C's are the capacities that the world cannot get enough of in the 21st century. And today, today, today we come together for an important cause, and we begin uh, on this stage, uh, which is named for uh, our founder, uh, for the Arts Emerson founder, Robert Orchard, who has been a driving force in Boston's theater scene uh, for more than four decades. And so we come together today in support of the arts, in support of collaboration and creativity, um, and in support of the great need to use our collective and collaborative voices to advocate for the arts. I need not tell you that we must invest in the arts because the arts matter. The arts bring people together. The arts connect diverse uh, ideas and dis disciplines. The art helps us to understand 
the world. You know, there are those who see the future and they run from it. There are those who see the future and they hide from it. And there are those who see the future who, and run towards it. And the arts always will run towards the future, something that we need so desperately. We also know that arts boasts the economy. Regional arts and cultural organizations directly create more than a billion dollars a year in our local economy and provides almost 30,000 jobs. And so today, uh, among many days, uh, this is a critical moment to make our voices heard, to advocate for investing in the arts, and to do it as effectively as possible. Today, you will have the opportunity to learn about and practice just that, and I hope you will take what you learned today and apply it to the arts, of course, but also to advocate about issues which you are passionate so others may see the incredible value of the arts. The one message that I wanted you to take to the State House today is that Massachusetts currently lacks a comprehensive and coordinated plan to support art, artists, and the vital institutions that support both. Uh, these institutions rely on dwindling corporate support and private donations to bridge the gap between ticket revenue and the high cost of staging performances, events, and exhibitions, or they simply have to foot the bill themselves. And that is the message that I want you to take today to the State House to remind our legislators that arts and artists build bridges and not walls. And today, we need you more than ever before. So. So I thank you for participating in today's events. Uh, bundle up, because it's a little chilly out there. Uh, and thank you for all that you do to support, promote, and advance arts, the arts, and artists in our community. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning up in the balcony. Uh, my name is Matt Wilson, and I'm the executive director of Mass Creative. Uh, for the past six years, Mass Creative has organized grassroots supporters like yourself uh, of the arts, creative leaders, partner organizations, and working artists from around the Commonwealth to build a culture here in Massachusetts where arts and creativity are expected, are recognized and valued as a part of everyday life. Uh, today's Arts Advocacy Day, Creativity Connects, is a great example of how we at Mass Creative do our work. With each of our projects and campaigns, our first step always is to collaborate with great partners. So I want to extend a very warm thank you to the many people and organizations who really helped uh, make today happen. Um, first of all, the in-house entities of Emerson College and Arts Emerson for hosting us in HowlRound for uh, live streaming uh, this event and for the closed caption that they're providing. And uh, special thanks to David for uh, keeping us in line today. Uh, our legislative champions, who you will be uh, meeting over the course of the day, uh, State Representatives Mary, Mary Keefe of Worcester, Paul McMurtry from Dedham, and State Senator Edward Kennedy of Lowell. Uh, I want to thank all of our financial supporters who throughout the year keep us going from our 400 member organizations and individual members and our longtime uh, foundation supporters. And I'm really thrilled to thank our most recent supporters uh, who have stepped up to specifically support this event. Uh, the Cambridge Savings Bank and a number of community foundations uh, who for the first time have stepped up to support the great statewide work that's being done. Uh, the, Cambridge Family Found the Cambridge Community Foundation, the Community Foundations of South Southeastern Massachusetts, the Essex County Community Foundation, the Greater Lowell Community Foundation, and the Trustees and Advisors Fund of the Foundation for Metro West. Uh, so support from all across the state. 
And as you have seen, it's, it's really a village of, of volunteers uh, here that are making, who are partnering with the staff today to make it all happen. Um, from the volunteers who you met at registration uh, to our stellar board of directors who are helping in all phases of the day, um, both on stage and behind the scene, to all our speakers and performers, and to the captains uh, who are holding those great signs who are going to lead us uh, to the State House this afternoon. Uh, and bottom line, we can't achieve anything that we're doing and the charge that uh, President Pelton uh, gave you uh, without all of you. Um, today we have representatives and working artists from over 235 distinct arts and cultural institutions from across the state. Isn't that amazing? A broad set of folks. From North Adams, right? <laughs> Down to the Cape, all across the state. Um, we're incredibly grateful for all of you uh, to working with so many talented partners who share our vision of a commonwealth in which creativity connects people. Um, and, and it's that phrase, uh, creativity connects, which you're going to hear a lot about today. It's not just a slogan, it's not just the title of this event, but it's a statement of truth. When we have a creative experience, see a provocative play, or visit a compelling exhibit, we're able to connect to our world and to stand in other people's shoes to experience the world in a new and different way. When we express our creativity, we connect with others who are singing, acting, dancing, and drawing alongside us. When we participate in local art walks, festivals, concerts, and any of the many community events organized by local cultural councils, working artists, and cultural institutions, we feel more connected with the special people around us, our friends, our family, and our neighbors. And we know that cities and towns with cultural districts and arts institutions that have been supported by our local and state government find that residents are more connected across racial, ethnic, and class divides thanks to the additional opportunities to connect through community-based cultural events. Well, none of this should be surprising to all of you. You are creating these opportunities for connection, and it's never been, in, it's never been more important than it is today. We are really living in divisive times. Uh, more of us, myself included, feel isolated and divided by politics, by technology, and by the growing gaps in income and wealth. Uh, technolo technology can isolate us. We can now do all of our shopping, all of our work, all of our banking, get all of our news, all by ourselves in front of our computer without taking a step outside. Our political leaders now see the benefit of de developing platforms and delivering narratives that divide us rather than build community. The historic social for forces that have disadvantaged people of color, women, immigrants, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities, and other oppressed groups feel just as alive today as they've ever been. And wealth disparity exacerbates all of this and continues to grow in the U.S., creating different, uh, deeper divisions and chasms in our society. We all need and we all crave connections to live happily, healthy, and fulfilling lives. Yet our society, and by our extension, our broader democracy is becoming increasingly isolated and disengaged. So that's where we come in. Our work creates connections. We are the change makers of today. We're healers, we're educators, we're placemakers, we're placekeepers, we're entrepreneurs and storytellers. Emerging research shows something we've long believed to be true. Opportunities for creative expression are just as important to our well-being as adequate food, housing, income, and a pursuit of meaningful work. Sharing creative experiences and expressing creativities build powerful connections with the people we're closest to our community and the world around us. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do, as President Pelton talked about. We have a lot of work to do with our political leaders to help them embed the work that we're doing, arts and creativity, as a vital asset to addressing these issue, issues here in the Commonwealth. Uh, today at the State House, uh, you'll hear about what we're going to talk to our legislators and what our priorities are. We'll be, f we'll be focusing on building support for public art, for increasing the Commonwealth's investment in the arts and creative community through the Mass Cultural Council's budget and the importance of arts education for our kids. 
but there's going to be more over the course of the year. Uh, working with you and our partners, we're going to be working with all of you and our partners to develop a long-term campaign to significantly increase investments in the art through a dedicated and robust uh, revenue stream at the state level. Uh, we're going to work with a broad coalition of groups to ensure that all of us are counted through the 2020 census by working with you all in a statewide Get Out the Count campaign and make sure that every single one of us is counted and that we matter here in the, in the Commonwealth. And we're going to be assisting a group of uh, uh, energetic and passionate high school students here in Boston who are demanding real access to arts education here in the Boston high schools. So I want to thank you all for taking uh, the day to come to Boston uh, along with all of us, uh, the 350 or so of you who are here today, and for the time you take each and every day to play such an important role in advocating to make our Commonwealth a better place. Um, I had the chance to meet a number of you um, over breakfast, and I look forward to meeting you, uh, meeting all of you here on the march at the State House and for a cold beer at Democracy Brewing. Uh, so thank you uh, for coming, and I, I now want to introduce uh, Anita Walker, who for more than 11 years has been the executive director of the Mass Cultural Council. Mass Cultural Council. Uh, she is working with her staff to strategically invest uh, the steadily growing resources that the state is giving to the arts community across, across the Commonwealth to the creative sector. Uh, so please welcome Anita Walker. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Are you psyched for today? It's Arts Advocacy Day. All right, I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, thank you, Matt. Thanks, Max Creative. Thanks for all of you for being here today. I want you to do something right now in the dark. I know it might be a little bit difficult, but I want you to turn to the person next to you and look them in the eye and smile. Thank you. Oh, little lights up. Good. This is a thing we call eye contact. Let's never forget about it. You know, um, I just read a book that says, its contention, its theory is that um, the bright side is not getting the attention it deserves. Well, I want you to know there is plenty of bright side, and this room is full of it. You are the bright side, and you prove it every single day when you get up and go to work, and even when you're not at work when you're at play. You know, let's think about it. Let's think about how we transitioned from the manufacturing industrial economy into this wrenching change of the information age and the creative economy. Who was there to pave the way? Who was there to make it right? You were. When company towns folded up, the companies packed up and left thousands of families without their sole source of income. It was you, the artist entrepreneur, who came in and filled up those empty storefronts and filled up those mill buildings. When we were trying to understand how we were going to take innovation and replace manual labor, it was the artist teachers in the schools who nurtured those creative minds and critical thinking skills so they'd be prepared for this creative economy. When we were all trying to understand what is this big technological corporate world where move fast and break things, rigor and risk walk hand in hand. The idea is the economy. Well, you know what? Artists have known this since the beginning of time. You are not only the basis, the foundation of the creative economy, you're the ones who make it sing. But let's not forget what our own Robert Kennedy reminded us decades ago. The health of our society is not measured solely by the gross national product. It doesn't measure the things that make life worthwhile, the beauty of a poem, 
the intelligence our, of our public discourse, the integrity of our public officials, and I think he'd let me add our sense of well-being, our collective wellness. These are the things that are under threat today, the things that are the best of being human. You know, you can feel it in the air. There's a sort of a permeating, ever-present sense of anxiety. Let's call it what it is, anger, uncertainty, rage. You know, it's like, it's like a virus that spreads through social media, through our obsessions, focus on screens. But it's a virus that's not spread by human contact. On the contrary, human contact is the cure. That is your superpower. Our historians that connect us with the past so we can understand the present, our scientists that give us a telescope into the future, and our artists who speak with empathy, connecting all of us. That's what you do so well. So you can imagine my shock on Sunday morning as I sat down, as I always do, to read the New York Times. And here is a headline that says, human contact is becoming a luxury. A luxury because technology's gotten so cheap. It can, it can replace human contact. So here's the story in the New York Times. It's about a guy by the name of Bill Langlois from Lowell, Massachusetts. He's a retiree. He spends a lot of his time at home with no one around. His wife is out and about. And um, he had nobody to talk to. So he tears up when he tells the story of the day when he got a companion, a cat that he named Socks, after the Red Sox, of course. <laughs> but this cat is not a regular cat. This cat is an avatar. This cat is a computer program. This is a cat, an animated cat on a computer screen, that speaks to him from operators thousands of miles away in the Philippines with a voice that sounds like Siri. And you know what Bill says? Having this cat with me makes me feel like there's someone around who cares. Now, you know, Bill is not unlike literally thousands of senior citizens who are isolated and alone, isolation that leads to depression. You might be surprised that many of these seniors take themselves to hospital emergency rooms for the social interaction. So, Humana, the giant insurance corporation, sees seniors going to emergency rooms, racking up medical bills, and they're thinking, why don't we just give everybody one of these computer cats? They've calculated that they can save as much as $90,000 per patient with a robotic cat. I think we can do better than that. I think you do better than that. And I know that we are all doing better than that. So let's just take a little trip across the pond to England, where this year, doctors officially began what's called social prescribing. They prescribe the arts. It's an intervention for depression. It's an antidote to isolation. They say to their patients, they literally write a script. Go to the theater. Go contemplate a work of art. Write your way through your trauma. The arts leads to wellness. And people with low levels of wellness are sicker and have a lower life expectancy. People who participate in the arts are 60% healthier than people who don't. So the Brits have figured out that not only are the arts good for people, 
They're cost effective. Do you know what they have discovered is the number one cost of expensive medical care for senior citizens over the age of 75? Falling down. So they prescribe ballet for strengthening and balance. Now, you are all here today to get yourself revved up to go over to the State House, and you're going to be talking to your legislators. And you're going to be talking to your legislators about investing more in the arts and culture. And do you know what they're going to say to you? I'm going to tell you this, and email me if I'm wrong. They're going to say to you, oh, we appreciate what you do. We know how important your work is. But you have to understand, the budget is so tight. It's just so difficult to find new money. And they're going to say, do you realize what the budget buster is in state revenue? The cost of, wait for it, health care. It takes up 37% of the state budget. We can't afford to do anything else. Well, you might say, you know what, you can't afford not to. Because the work of our museums and our theaters and our artists and our teaching artists, they're not providing an animated robot with a disembodied voice thousands of miles away to people. They're looking in their eyes. They're having a conversation. They're improving wellness and they're lowering the cost of health care. That's what you do. So now I'm thinking about Bill and Lowell. And I'd like to meet Bill. I haven't met Bill yet. But I'm thinking that if I meet him, I'd say, Bill, I'm not going to take your cat away. I know you already have a relationship with your cat. But I would like to introduce you to a teaching artist, maybe one who can give you and your wife a dose of dance and human contact, and a bit of the bright side. Thank you so much for all you do and for your advocacy today. Now you know that we have great champions on Beacon Hill, and actually Massachusetts is the only state that has its own committee on tourism, arts, and cultural development. This year we have new leadership on our committees, and I am so honored and privileged to be able to introduce the Senate leader of our committee, who happens to be from Lowell, so maybe he can help me find Bill, Senator Ed Kennedy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning to everybody, and thank you for having me here today and allowing me to speak. I was excited to find, that, find out that I had been chosen the Senate Chair of the Committee on Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development um, in Massachusetts because I thought it meant that I could probably spend sessions holding hearings in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard this summer. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not sure that would fly. Um, but in all seriousness, I am aware that tourism, arts, and culture is big business in Massachusetts, with the tourism industry bringing in $20 billion in direct spending into the state and employing 150,000 people across the Commonwealth. And the arts and culture sector contributing a stunning $1 billion into the local economy annually, supporting more than 73,000 jobs. Despite the robust nature of these industries and the vibrance and increased quality of life they bring to our communities, dedicated funding sources remain scarce. While California spends $120 million uh, annually on destination marketing efforts, Massachusetts allocates only $10 million, less than half the national average. This is an area where you need to spend money to make money, and I believe we are missing out on significant revenue streams. 
My home, hometown of Lowell began mocking itself as, as a home to artists several decades ago. Arts and culture have been a key to the city's rebirth, um, and hundreds of artists and creators who have moved to Lowell from the Boston area and other parts of the state and nation since the time and that they have brought color, fun, insight, and awareness to Lowell. Their presence and work has been an economic engine and marketing hook for the city. Their enthusiasm and willingness to get involved in civic life and local causes has increased the quality of life for all Lowellians. I see the difference grant funding from the Massachusetts Cultural Council makes in Lowell every day. This year, the Lowell Cultural Council granted $75,000 in grants to 28 artists, nonprofit organizations, events, and institutions. The Lowell Cultural Council has made a variety of programs possible this year, including Salsa in the Park, which provides free salsa dancing lessons in Lowell's uh, North Common, bringing life to a public park in the heart of the city's lowest income neighborhood providing entertainment and building community, the, the, the Lowell Kinetic Sculpture Race, which brings STEM activities to life for children and adults of all ages, as well as spectators and participants from around the region and across the country, bringing poetry and arts programming to Lowell public school students, programs which are often the first victims of budget cuts, funding Cambodian and African cultural programs, bringing these groups to celebrate their heritage and keep it alive while introducing their customs and culture to those of us from other backgrounds, and even funding the interpretation of cultural programming throughout the city in American Sign Language. All of these programs and the dozens of others funded through the Cultural Council help make Lowell a vibrant city, attracting visitors with money to spend and boosting the quality of life for residents of the city. Statewide, Grant funding provides to local culture councils by the Mass Cultural, Cultural Council provides support to more than 6,000 artists, community groups, and organizations annually, many of whom would not be able to secure funding otherwise. Lowell has been greatly transformed by this installation of public art, including many works by pr the prolific sculptor, the late Miko Kaufman. These works are just as important to the aesthetic of our downtown and the historic architecture um, in Lowell. They make it a more inviting and interesting place to draw people to spaces that otherwise would be underutilized. Drawing people out to public spaces builds community and pride in the neighborhood as well as reduces crime. As the Senate Chair of Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development, I look forward to helping mass creative advocate for their policy platform this session, including allocating $18 million in funding for the Massachusetts Cultural Council. <laughs> and establishing the Massachusetts Public Arts Program. Thank you very much. So, now, I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our house chair, who I've known as long as I've been here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He is truly, truly passionately and authentically a supporter of the arts, since he actually is involved in his spare time running an actual movie theater. It's my pleasure to introduce Representative Paul McMurtry. Good morning. Thank you very much, Anita. How about a nice round of applause for Anita Walker? Well, well deserved. She is a, a great leader and advocate on behalf of the arts community. And after all, we are here in the theater, and uh, applause comes uh, secondhand. And again, for my colleague in the Senate, how about a nice round of applause for Senator Kennedy? I look forward to uh, working with him in my new role as the chairman of uh, Tourism, Arts, and Culture. And I'm excited about uh, the support that has been given to the arts community uh, in the past and look forward to uh, working this session um, in, in moving and advancing the items uh, that are important to you. And I want to let you know, make no mistake, uh, it cannot be done with legislators alone or with executive directors as Anita Walker. And uh, it, it's, it's done in part, uh, in major part, 
through the advocacy and the work of each and every one of you. So um, today is an important day as you come up to Beacon Hill and um, advocate to your reps and senators and their staff for uh, emphasizing the importance and the significance that arts uh, have uh, to you and uh, into the community. Um, Mass Creative also and it does an incredible job, so I appreciate that you are all connected um, and working on, on their behalf of providing equal access, as you all know, with cultural engagement, education, and creative expression. Equal access is really the key phrase um, and the main goal. And we unfortunately live in a time, as we all know, of limited uh, resources and uh, where the administrations and us in the legislature have to make difficult decisions. And typically, the arts programs are the first ones to be cut. So we have to uh, let legislators and my colleagues know at the State House that um, we need to make sure that we can continue funding. We don't want to have students in the community suffer any longer as we cut individuals uh, and, and our, our uh, cities and towns off from that rich uh, cultural history that the Commonwealth has to offer and the rich uh, life quality of life that exposing them to uh, arts and and the art uh, experience. Um, we all know that the arts build bridges across communities, uh, classes, and ethnicities, and it's an equalizer that definitely enhances cities and towns we live in. Um, and it provides countless opportunities for young people throughout the Commonwealth. And for this reason, um, and, and many others, I'm certainly proud to serve on the committee um, and continue the work that uh, Mass uh, creative and the Mass Cultural Council and other important uh, organizations continue to do. Um, I served many years ago as the House Vice Chair of the committee and now certainly um, am thrilled to be in the chairmanship position where we're able to continue to prioritize um, bills. One of the bills in particular that I know you're all familiar with is House Bill 2941 which was filed by my colleague Representative Keefe um, who chairs the uh, Cultural ca Caucus at the State House? Um, it's the Massachusetts Public Arts Program uh, uh, requesting uh, $2 million in the creation and preservation of public art installation on state owned property. So we've seen the success of these projects throughout the Commonwealth, and we want to continue to uh, advocate for those um, throughout uh, on these state owned uh, lands. So, and th we know that the, the, these enhance uh, communities and tourists and uh, residents of the Commonwealth, and we've seen 90 public art pro projects installed along six major lines of the MBTA, so we want to continue to engage the Mass, uh, the Mass Transportation Authority um, to bring some public art into their uh, facilities and stations. Um, and these projects not only add color and life to our public spaces, but they add authenticity to uh, our sometimes um, drab transportation system. So, as I mentioned, I'm proud to be a sponsor of them, and I look forward as a chair. Um, as Anita mentioned, um, in my other life, or maybe previous life, and the reason why I got into public service, I uh, have a similar um, art uh, experience with owning an art house movie theater. Um, and when I was running for office some 12 years ago, people said to me, we'll vote for you as long as you keep that theater open. So um, that was my pledge back then. I continue to um, support and, uh, the arts and art initiatives across the Commonwealth. And I look forward to working with each and every one, and you, one of you this session as we make sure that we emphasize to both our colleagues in the legislature and to the administration and uh, the partnership we have with the Baker, Lieutenant Governor uh, Polito and Governor Baker on um, the importance of bringing arts to not only to our classrooms but to our communities and continue to make a difference and deliver back the incredible quality of life we have here in the Commonwealth. And again, make no mistake, that's in, uh, all in part to your efforts and I'm proud to work with you. I'll see you back at the State House this afternoon. Thank you for your advocacy and enjoy the rest of the morning. Great. Um, how, how's everybody doing?
Yes, good, good. Join me in thanking our speakers. We had President Pelton, Matt Wilson, and his team. Thank you for all that you do on behalf of uh, our sector, as well as Anita Walker and her team, tireless advocates for the work that we're doing. And it's also special um, thanks to Senator Kennedy and Representative uh, McMurtry for their uh, leadership in the State House. It's great to have them here with us today and to have such wonderful leaders working on our behalf um, down the street. So this morning, we want to give you some information, as I mentioned earlier on the trainings, and some training for successful meetings. First, we'll introduce you to Mass Creative's policy platform and share two specific asks that we'll suggest that you make when you meet with your legislator. Then we'll share some storytelling techniques. And then finally, we'll have Representative uh, Mary Keefe and advocates from Worcester put everything together and show us uh, what a successful meeting looks like. They'll cover sort of the, the four C's, and I won't spend a lot of time going through those now because they'll demonstrate that a little bit later, but the four C's are connect, context, commitment, and catapult. Connect, meaning make a personal connection with your legislator, then give some context, share the impact of the arts and cultural community in your city or town. And the commitment, ask them to do something, support to the ask that we're um, going to suggest. That's the Mass Cultural Council budget and the Mass Public Art Program bill. And then finally, catapult. Make a plan to follow up with your legislator on the commitments and sustaining a long-term relationship with, um, with the legislature. So we've got that coming in just a little while. But before we move there, we're fortunate as arts people to have wonderful artists in our midst. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Delena Morrison, Sydney Grant, and Juan Arevalo from Central Square Youth Theaters, nope, Central Square Theaters Youth Underground. Hello. Thank you. Move over a little. Move over a little. Move over a little. So Act Up and Vote is a new work of investigative theater exploring voting, civic engagement for young people. And here's a sample. My brother and I shared a room and it was on the second floor. So <laughs> every day, multiple times a day, I had to go up and down a staircase to get between our room and the kitchen or the bathroom or anything else downstairs. <laughs> um, and on that staircase were a ton of anti-war posters that my dad brought back from El Salvador. And there's one that I will never forget. It's pink. And there's a woman on it. She's a mother with a child on her back and a rifle in her hand. I would see these posters and they're beautiful, they're artwork. And I always found it crazy thinking about my dad fighting in a war at 14, fighting for the betterment of his family, for his people. I grew up seeing these posters and I grew up knowing that my dad was fighting in a war as a child that he didn't want to be in. And then he came here to this country to do anti-war work. I believe that that fight is a part of me and has been my whole life. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I was that kid in the stroller going to protests with not only my parents, but with a community committed to the belief that they can make a change by taking over the streets and, and believing that their voices and their bodies can influence others. There's no other thing that I would do. I work with my heart, and activism is in my blood. So, I'm in fashion school, and I spent my junior year in Paris. While I was there, I had an acute episode, which can happen because of my diagnosis with sickle cell, and I had to be hospitalized in Paris for two weeks. Unfortunately, a similar health crisis occurred a few years back when I was studying in New York City. Even though I had some insurance, 
the outstanding balance was $14,000. <laughs> I was hounded day and night by collection agencies to pay that amount. I mean, as if. So you can imagine my stress about what this hospitalization was gonna cost. But no worries. My care was free, completely covered. So now I'm on a mission, okay? Check it out. It's a picture of a sickle cell in its unusual crescent shape and blood red form. And now it's gonna be a design motif on all of my clothing. So I will not only be using fashion as a vehicle for self-expression, but also as a way to bring attention to people like me. People who have pre-existing conditions and are now at risk of being denied insurance. Like, what is so messed up about America that we don't have a universal healthcare system like other developed nations? Thank you. Because y'all, when you're hurting, politics becomes personal real fast. You know? So is voting gonna solve my problem? Like, really? Sometimes I think of moving to Paris because probably nobody is ever gonna wanna cover me here. It was a protest against the gentrification of our neighborhood. You know, sometimes developers come to community meetings and say, we want to hear from you. <laughs> this building is going up, and we would like your input so we can make changes and know what you would like to see, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but I've noticed, oh, and oh, I've noticed, no one takes notes. I mean, if you care and want to remember what is being said, you take notes. They don't really care, but I do, because it's where I live, it's where most of my extended family lives, it's where my friends live. Our protest was to make sure that our concerns were heard. There was a vote before the city council to raise the affordable housing rate from 15% to 20%, and we wanted to make sure that it was going to pass. But it was also about bringing attention to the need for more affordable housing in our neighborhood. Take this note, okay? We want affordable housing that looks like it fits in our neighborhood. We don't just want new high-rise apartment buildings where 20% of the people who can't afford the high rent get to live there but aren't really welcomed by the other residents. Take this note in all caps. We want a world in which we can be comfortable in our own home. We want a world where we can imagine a future. We're young, and we want to be able to afford to live here when we're like older, like 30, you know? <laughs> and even raise our families and, you know, where we grew up. And, and this note to my friends, I see you. Don't just sit on your couch and do nothing, but wait. It's your time. Claim your space. Act up and vote. Do you want to step? Okay. Right, we can go. Good morning. My name is Emily Ruddick, and I am the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at Mass Creative. And it is a true thrill to be standing on this stage because in 2015, uh, Matt Wilson asked a newly hired Lynn Downtown Cultural District Director to speak at the first Arts Advocacy Day. Uh, and now uh, to see this room packed with people, to see us all excited about this work, um, and to be a part of it is truly thrilling. So thank you for indulging me for a moment. Um, so my charge at Mass Creative is taking and thinking about all the stories all the things that we do well and all the things that we need to do better. Um, and to work with our community, with our leaders, with our partners to think about what are the policies and what are the changes that we need to make a difference. So I am really pleased to unveil the 2019-2020 policy platform. Pretty fancy animated slide. 
Um, we, we worked with our board, our policy committee, our leadership council, with artists across the Commonwealth um, to think about how we can arrange our work to think through five realms um, of impact, both in terms of what we can bring to the Commonwealth and what we need to do better. The first one is happy and healthy people. Opportunities for cultural engagement and creative expression are just as integral as social well-being, as adequate food, housing, income, and the opportunity to pursue meaningful activities. The second, equal access and opportunities for participation. Everyone in Massachusetts has the right to experience creativity and culture, express themselves creatively, and see their culture reflected in artistic expression. Connected communities. Community-based art programs build bridges across ethnic and class divides, connect people throughout their communities. Access to a well-rounded education for all students and young people. Arts education enhances student achievement across all subjects. It cultivates the creative mindset that leads to success in the 21st century workplace but it also increases civic engagement and leadership. Respect and support for the creative workforce and economy. And this one, I think, is the one that we really need to think about today. Massachusetts' creative and cultural sector is a vital contributor to the Commonwealth's economy. And we need to pursue policies that make sure we have the support and the um, room to do our best work. So, in the coming weeks and months, you will see on Mass Creative's website more information, more policy suggestions, more connections with other partner organizations that we're working with to drive our agenda and their agenda forward. But, I thought it might be useful to hear from four individuals who are working in these realms and can share a little bit about how they impact uh, their communities. So, um, I would like to welcome to the stage Carrie from Shelter, Shelter Music, who will talk about health and wellness. Thank you, Carrie. Hey, everyone. Super bright up here. So that's me, and I'm an Emerson alum. Uh, so this is a thank you, thank you. Uh, so this is a really cool intersection of my past and my present. Uh, and at Shelter Music Boston, we believe that everyone deserves access to the passion, dignity, and creativity of classical music, whether or not they have a home. So if you can get behind that idea, give give a shout out. Thank you. That, that's why we're all here, right? So because of this belief, uh, our team of professional musicians perform classical chamber music concerts each month in homeless shelters, recovery centers, and an after-school program throughout Greater Boston. We bring full-length concerts directly to people who need the transformational power of music the most. Last year, we performed nearly 90 concerts for about 2,000 audience members. Our innovative programming spans the centuries, a range of composers, different styles of classical music, all with the goal of evoking a range of emotions for our audiences. We even created a suite of new music in collaboration with our, audience, our audiences, which was amazing. And while the music is critical to our mission, the concerts really become a catalyst for the respectful and dignified human connections that happen from start to finish in our performances. And that's something that our audiences don't get much of uh, in, their, in their circumstances. So I'm sure uh, many of you know that there's a lot of research out there that points to the healing effects of music in treating depression, anxiety, insomnia, pain, uh, dementia, on and on, and, and we see this at Shelter Music Boston time and time again uh, in the way our audiences respond to our concerts. We administer short surveys after each of our concerts, and I thought what better way to illustrate 
uh, the immediate and positive impact of music and our model than by sharing some of those comments with you. And we've collected over you know, hundreds of comments in, in our history. Uh, these comments are, are just a few from February of this year, actually, uh, when we had a concert that, that featured a violin and flute duo, uh, including a handmade Native American flute that was wildly popular with our audiences. So uh, I want to I want to share a few of these comments. Like I said, so after one of the concerts, a listener indicated feeling that all my problems were gone and I could deal with them. That's pretty remarkable. Another listener felt stressed before the concert and hopeful after. Another told us that that they felt very stressed, anxiety, fear before the concert, and after felt relaxed at peace and happy. I like this one. I like them all, but I like this one. Uh, another listener shared that before the concert, they had a headache and they were very tired. And after, they were energized and without the headache. We've got tons of comments about people who come in with pain before a concert and leave without that pain, uh, which I think is incredible. A couple of very simple but poignant comments were that uh, a listener felt depressed before the concert and calm after. Another felt sad and hurt before the concert and better after. Uh, another listener wrote honestly that before the concert he felt anxious and truly did not want to sit through classical music being played. We get that. We hear that. Yet, after he wrote that he felt amazing, relaxed, and very happy. A huge difference in how I felt. Truly was a gift. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Another listener, when asked what they enjoyed the most about the concert, wrote, happy, brings back memories of school. You are awesome, continue to do what you do. Music is therapeutic, doctor recommended. So I'm thinking back to what Anita told us earlier about what they're doing in the UK, and if doctors here would just prescribe music, arts, arts therapy, uh, I think we would be in better shape. Um, I don't know if this photo has already come up, but uh, this is, Anyway, you may have seen it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, SMB photos is our founder, Julie Levin, uh, talking with a young man uh, after a shelter concert. And this actually happened a few years ago, so not from, from February. But um, the picture, they're, they're kind of looking at his phone. They're talking animatedly about music. And I overheard him telling Julie that he had been going through a detox and he hadn't been getting much sleep. But because he had heard our concert and our music, he felt confident that he was gonna sleep that night. And that comment has really stuck with me and it, it felt really, it has always felt very powerful to me about the impact of our music and, and what our program does. So I could read comments to you all day, uh, but I hope I've given you not only a flavor for what Shelter Music Boston does, but that I've made a compelling case, and I know that I am preaching to the converts here, but that I've made a compelling case uh, that the arts are as necessary to our overall well-being as food, shelter, clothing, income, housing, all the, all the things that, that the happy and healthy people platform suggests, and that's why we need more support for the creative community, and that's why we're all here today, and that's why I'm here today. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Carrie. I'd like to welcome Catherine Morris to the stage. Before I start, I'm going to ask everyone to turn to their neighbor and say good morning. Good morning. We're going to do church today. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Catherine Morris. I'm the founder of Boston Art Music Soul Fest. Yeah. For those that don't know, we are a nonprofit that strives to break down racial and social barriers to arts, music, and culture for marginalized communities and artists of color across greater Boston. And about eight years ago, I had a dream. And that dream was to come back home to Boston after going to school and start a festival that represented and celebrated the contributions and impact and influence of black artistry to this city. Because there's been a history of neglect, oversight, and undervaluing what black artistry has done for this city. Yeah. 
There's a quote that an elder in the community uh, shared with me when I started my journey, and it's, it's a quote from Nina Simone, so I'm gonna paraphrase, but the line is, it is an artist's responsibility to reflect at times. Part of that is, as consumers and as advocates, we have a responsibility to support the artist to reflect the times that they live in. And that comes from transparency, funding, being there physically, mentally, sending an email, a chat, a tweet, checking in on an artist. Because I know, as I've experienced, that creativity can be a lonely process. So, in 2014, I started Bands Festival. I wanted to activate Franklin Park because it's underutilized. It's the largest green space that connects six or more neighborhoods. And I felt like it just needed a little bit of oomph. And in this process, I learned from many different artists about the struggles of what it means to be an entrepreneur in this city. I can't do what artists do, but I can advocate and support their platform. So I created my own. And in that process of listening to different artists, I realized there were some things that they needed, basic things. There's a lot of artists in the room that may have not, gotten, may have not received their degrees, but they discovered that they have a passion and a talent and a gift. And they just need a little bit of help to perfect it, to be better, to be stable, to be healthy. Now again, I'm not an artist, but I'm pretty well connected to crazy people. <laughs> and all I have to do is open my mouth and say, hey, you should connect to this person. And what I started to learn was a series of relationships and a new ecosystem that I was creating and I didn't even know it just from watching other artists. So to date, we work with 180 artists of color across Boston. Yes. We have mobilized over 5,000 people to all of our events. We have partnered with 16 venues. We have worked with over 60 organizations and businesses and, organiz and, and businesses to really help perpetuate and push forward the notion that all artistry is our artistry. And it is important today that when you go to the State House, please let them know that the clothes that they wear, the building that they walk in, the car that they drive, the color palettes that they chose were designed by artists. So I thank you all. Have a good morning. Thank you very much. Priscilla Kane Hellick, will you please join us up? Hi, everybody. Wow. I am delighted to be here today to speak on behalf of arts and education, which has been in my heart and soul for as long as I've lived. We need equal access to a well-rounded education for all. My name is Priscilla Kane Helweg. I'm the executive director of Enchanted Circle Theater. We're based in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Yeah. And I'm here to say that arts and education is alive and well in Western Massachusetts. Enchanted Circle is a multi-service arts organization that is dedicated to engaging, enhancing, and inspiring learning through the arts. We were founded in 1976, it's a long time ago, for a small arts organization individually run to be dedicated to community service. We have been pioneers in the field of arts integration and creative youth development, transforming the learning experience for people of all ages and abilities. The work we do is serious business. We bring joy back into learning. Enchanted Circle uses theater arts as a dynamic teaching tool to engage active and creative learning. We work directly in the public school classroom from preschool through high school, bringing project-based, arts-integrated learning into math and science and social studies and English language arts. We engage students in their own creative learning process. And surprise, surprise, attendance records go up 
Scores go up and behavior issues go down. Education is the social justice issue. We imagine what happens in the classroom when arts integrated math happens and students start physically embodying isosceles triangles together when they become parallelograms together. Imagine in a living history program where students are researching and writing and ultimately performing their own original plays on the Trail of Tears, on child labor in the Industrial Revolution. Imagine from STEM to STEAM how the arts and creative expression ignites students' ideas and enable them to create solutions to tomorrow's challenges. These are never to be forgotten experiences. Our students want to come to school. Enchanted Circle also works in special education, in residential and school-based programs for youth with cognitive and behavioral challenges, focusing on life skills, communication, collaboration, creative problem solving, these are life skills through the arts that prepare all of our children for life beyond the classroom. And we work in creative youth development, in the juvenile justice system and with youth in foster care, developing their capacity to connect with others and giving them a platform to have their voices heard and awakening them that relationship and a sense of purpose in connecting to the world around them. We have a program called Youth Truth, funded for many years through the Mass Cultural Council. These are youth ages 14 to 24 whose lives have been impacted by foster care. Well, Destiny has been with us now for five years. She's lived in 24 homes in her 19 years. Youth Truth has become her home, her family, where she learned to trust, where she learned to imagine what could be, where she learned to communicate her hopes and her fears and her dreams and to reach out to connect with others. So Destiny now is a freshman at Holyoke Community College. And she is a leader in Youth Truth, and she is working to help us re envision foster care in America. <laughs> to destiny. <laughs> we are serving an essential need in fostering creative and critical thinking for many of the most marginalized youth and underserved children and families in Massachusetts. Enchanted Circle serves all four counties in western Massachusetts. In 2018, we facilitated 32 unique programs, and several of these are programs that go from September through June. Every Wednesday is Enchanted Circle Day. We are serving 4,400 students and teachers in 102 classrooms. We've worked with 1,600 youth and families in creative youth development programs and have inspired over 3,500 audience members through our performance and public art displays. Enchanted Circle works in close partnership with 25 school districts, developing programs with superintendents and curriculum directors and teachers and students, really instilling that sense of internal leadership, because it is relationship and it is all about what we can do together. This transformational process that bridges arts, education, and social services. We create equal access to arts-inspired learning, providing meaningful, accessible, and culturally relevant programs, and bringing the joy back into learning. Well, I'm very proud to say that as of last week, the superintendent of schools in Holyoke committed to a three-year arts plan process where he is working to make arts learning the norm in Holyoke Public Schools. We are developed absolutely. It's a long time coming. 
This plan, as this task force will be coming together, will be coordinating arts, programs, arts, education, K to 12 throughout the district, actually pre-K to 12, because it's now universal uh, pre-K in Holyoke. It involves professional development for teachers to give them the capacity to integrate the arts in little and big ways every day in their classrooms and a comprehensive plan to work with community partners because it does take a village to raise our children and give them equal access to the arts. So this afternoon, when we are in speaking with our state senators and representatives, ask them where they stand on arts education. Let them know how passionate you are about how the arts transform lives and ask them to help us bring learning alive for children and youth all over Massachusetts. Thank you Mass Creative for helping us advocate and organize and thank you Mass Cultural Council for supporting and leading the way. We are all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, I am filling in for um, our next speaker who couldn't join us today, Tracy, um, who is a public artist based in New Bedford. Um, and we were, she was going to talk about the role that public art plays in stronger communities and connected uh, neighborhoods. Um, one of the things that we are gonna ask you today to talk about with your legislators is the Massachusetts Public Art Program, which is in your packets in this lovely shade of blue. Um, this bill, which has been filed on the Senate side by Senator Adam Hines and on the House side by Representative Mary Keefe, would establish a fund to both maintain and preserve our existing public art in Massachusetts, but create more public art created by artists of Massachusetts, selected by a commission of us, of Massachusetts residents. Um, we are the only state in New England who doesn't have a public art program, and we've already seen how percent for art programs like this one in Boston have changed the amount of public art and the amount of people included in the process of public art. So I hope you will talk about this today with your legislators, and we thank you for your advocacy. And finally, I am going to welcome uh, Rebecca Wright from the Fitchburg Art Museum. It is bright. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to see everyone here in support of arts and creativity in our communities. I'm proud to represent the Fitchburg Art Museum. We are a catalyst for learning, creativity, and community building. Fitchburg Art Museum is a mid-sized art museum in Fitchburg, Mass., a city with a rich industrial heritage that has struggled economically in recent years and is starting to turn around, like Lowell, like New Bedford, like so many others, with the help of the arts. About six years ago, our board hired Nick Capasso, our director, with a mandate for the museum to be relevant, accessible, and of service to the community, both locally and regionally. One of the first things Nick did was launch our bilingual initiative to welcome the large and growing percentage of our city that is made up of Spanish-speaking residents. Banners on our building proclaim, fam is for everyone, and welcome in English and Spanish. All exhibition labels and signage are in English and Spanish, changing every time we open a new exhibition. We partner with local immigrant services organizations on programs. We feature Latino art and artists in our exhibitions. And we welcome visitors with a bilingual receptionist and bilingual docents. We have also made a commitment to free and reduced admission programs, especially for groups who may have felt excluded in the past, including the Mass Cultural Council's EBT Card to Culture program. More than 50% of our visitors benefit from free or reduced admission made possible by partnerships and grant funding. We have a community gallery where any community group can hold an exhibition at no charge, first come, first serve. This validates the creativity of everyday artists from all walks of life and has introduced us to new groups. 
Just recently, the No Evil Project in Worcester and IG Central Mass, grassroots arts organizations with equity and inclusion missions who we hope to work with again in the future. At the same time, we continue to present an active program of exhibitions of New England contemporary art, incorporating local and regional artists, which we strive to keep relevant to our audiences. With our small entrepreneurial staff, we are able to be nimble and respond to changing circumstances and opportunities. Recently, we are reorienting uh, from our traditional art classes to, vote our to devote our time and resources to programs that meet newly identified needs in the community. We've recently begun a partnership with the Worcester County Sheriff's Department to provide therapeutic art programs to people in recovery from opioid addiction. This spring, we are launching Thank you. <laughs> this spring, we are launching a partnership with Head Start to provide early childhood arts experiences in the museum for preschoolers from at-risk communities. We also offer programs for people with Alzheimer's and their caregivers, among others. We are very proud to have the UP designation, which stands for Universal Participation through the Mass Cultural Council in recognition of our access programs. UP recognizes and celebrates all efforts to reduce barriers to access for audiences who may not have felt welcome in the past. The Mass Cultural Council recognizes and also supports our work in the community. We receive funding from the Mass Cultural Council through its CIP program, through local cultural councils that support our regional exhibition, and through the Mass Cultural Facilities Fund. We also benefit from state funding indirectly through partnerships with non-arts organizations who we work with on creative economy initiatives to help revitalize the city of Fitchburg. We are fortunate to have active and engaged elected representatives who are our friends, who come to our events, and recognize the value of the arts and creativity in our community and in our everyday lives. They bring that enthusiasm and support to Beacon Hill, and we are going to meet with them this afternoon. Our success in serving the community is due to strong, focused leadership with alignment between board and staff and community stakeholders on our purpose and strategic goals. Developing programs that are responsive to the community means that people of diverse ages, abilities, and ethnicities feel welcome at the Fitchburg Art Museum. This is who we are. The leadership and support of the Mass Cultural Council and other state agencies creates an environment where this work is possible and encouraged. When we all provide opportunities for people to grow and learn, express their natural creativity, build relationships, and create lasting memories, that improves the quality of life in our communities and impacts everyone in our communities. Let's go raise up the support of the arts and the Mass Cultural Council with our legislators this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all for, thank you for your remarks. Um, I am always impressed with the stories of how we as a creative community do so much with sometimes so little. We know how to stretch a dollar more than anyone uh, or any sector. Um, but that's not enough, and we know that. We know that right now there are artists who are facing eviction. There are groups that aren't able to find performance space or venue space. We know that there are young people who are not receiving arts education classes, arts classes in their classroom, because it's just not possible uh, because of budget and because of the money. So today's the day where we come together and we walk to the State House and share just how important this issue is with our elected officials. But I want to remind you that obviously it's not just today. Every day we can be part of the advocacy work and tell our story about why what we do matters and how it is transformational. And I know no better group uh, to tell that story than the group I'm about to introduce on stage. So please welcome Maurice Parent, uh, Executive Director of Front Porch Arts Collective and his team of storytellers. Parent. 
I am Hippolyta Nyugurirba. I am Caroline. David. Meg. Rachel. Katie. Tracy. Nikki. Beth. Audrey. Harold. I am happy to be here with you today. This is awesome! Yeah. I am an actor, director, arts educator living in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Yeah. I am an everyday peace artist from Rwanda. I am studying arts management and living in air. I am the executive director of Fituit Center for the Arts on Cape Cod. Woo! Museum Woo! educator, author, and poet from Boston and Northampton. A sculptor and maker from the Crossroads Cultural District in Greenfield. Woo! I am from the Creative Collective. I'm a dancer and a community organizer from Jamaica Plain. Yeah. I'm the associate director of digital media at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Woo! A storyteller and organizer with the Massachusetts Voter Table. I lead the Network for Arts Administrators of Color at Arts Boston. The Interim Executive Director at the Theater Offensive and Emerson College Theater Professor. I am the co-founder of the Front Porch Arts Collective and a Mass Creative Board member. Before I found the arts, I was a shy, insecure, gay kid living in a religious family, being told that everything I felt and believed was wrong and damnable. I had my voice. I was not living my true life. Huh. Uh, uh, <laughs> afraid of being found out. Um, and I uh, didn't feel at home or safe in the one place where you're supposed to feel home and safe, with your family. I was alone. A shy and nervous kid. Destined to live a life in the heartland on the family farm, void of music, art, and culture. I was lucky. I was raised with pens, paintbrushes, and puppets in my hands. I honestly don't know who I'd be without them. I was suffering through a period of dark depression and grief. I was feeling unsure how I'd survive financially with my computer performance degree. I had a lot of energy that I didn't know what to do with. <laughs> My life was static and colorless. I was a pre-med student, struggling to reconcile my immigrant parents' dreams with my own. I was questioning my identity and my purpose. I was unsure about my cultural identity. I was starting a primary school just a few months after the genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi in Rwanda, which I survived. Most of the day school, I could, re I could be remembering the voices of men and children that I have seen being murdered, or the voices of women that I have seen being raped. I always wanted justice for them. Then I saw my first play. It was a musical in my elementary school, and I thought, I could do that. <laughs> I auditioned, yes. and I booked the gig, and then began my life as an artist and an actor. Then I started a theater uh, club, and we started the process of unity and reconciliation. Then I met my third grade public school music teacher. I had a great music teacher, Mr. Jacket, who told me that I could use music to figure out who I was. I met Vicki Washington, my cultural mother and high school theater teacher. I became a parent. I bought an old department store and turned it into an art gallery. <laughs> I met Salem local creative entrepreneur John Andrews, and now I get to work with hundreds of creative entrepreneurs every day. I pursued what made me happiest. I got a job at Nassar. <laughs> I tried track and field. I tried basketball. And then I saw a poster for 12 Angry Men on the wall outside my cafeteria, and I found theater. Then I met people with stories like my own. Now I am living my truth and my passion every day. I found love and acceptance from my found family and my given family, mm -hmm. and I am blessed to inspire others to do the same every day. Now I use theater and storytelling as the tools to prevent the intergenerational transmission of hate. Now I look people in the eye. Now I am immersed in music, theater, and art every day. 
Now I am committed to giving my son the same sense of self, of home, and of happiness in a world full of art, music, history, and imagination. Now I feel alive and spiritually awake every day. Now I spend my days promoting artist projects and initiating collaborations. Now I'm a community organizer. An organizer who knits together the stories with the common thread of the dreams of a better world. Now I see firsthand how students use art to create beauty and solve problems and how it saves them. Now I'm a culture bearer. Now I lead a life more interesting than I ever could have imagined. Now we are arts advocates. We believe in arts and creativity. I believe art, arts give voice to the voiceless, home to those that feel they don't belong, build community for those that feel isolated, teaches empathy and compassion for those that can't see beyond their own struggles. I believe art is the most powerful tool to revive the empathy that is lost in our everyday suffering. <laughs> children confidence. I believe the arts will lead the way to revitalize my small town. I believe arts bring us together across borders. I believe the arts make us resilient. Art tells stories of a world just within reach. In this divisive political moment, we need to connect with our neighbors and hear the stories of art being told in the media. I believe art allows us to reclaim our identity. Mm -hmm. I believe arts change lives. I believe arts are as important as the air we breathe and the food we eat. We know creativity and arts help our students, neighborhoods, and our Massachusetts to thrive. Creativity connects us. Arts matter. 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 support and increase investment for the arts and creative community. Thank you. One, two, I have holla, holla. All right. Microphone. Check. One, two, three. What we just did was model simple storytelling for you. Uh, I invite you all now to pull the green sheet out of your packet. I can see about half of y'all, and I see y'all doing it. Okay, oh, now I see you all. Pull out the green sheet. It says public narrative on it, and uh, it's at the top of your storytelling section. So what we're going to do now is have you take a minute to fill it out, then turn to the person next to you and practice telling your story. All right? In three minutes, and I'm going to time you, I got my cell phone, I'll remind you to switch. <clears throat> we all need practice at this, so uh, find a new friend, share your story, and this is in pre preparation for when you go to the State House. Let's share our stories and create some change. Thank you. Has some music to play or something.
I feel like I'm proctoring a final exam in a university. <laughs> it's amazing. Everyone's so, so studious and into it. This is beautiful. And as soon as you feel ready, find a neighbor, someone you don't know, and start sharing. Or if it's someone you do know, that's fine. In about one minute, I'll invite you all to switch. All right, and if you've been sharing, maybe this is a time for the other person to start sharing, so switch once you've wrapped it up.
About one more minute. All right, if we can start wrapping up the conversations. Girl. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Give yourselves a round of applause. So I want you all to breathe in the experience you just had, hearing other stories, sharing your own, and breathe in the power that has, the effects it made on you and those that were listening. And remember that today when you go speak to your representative. The power of telling your story and coming from an honest, true place is exactly what art has meant to your life, your constituents, and those that you reach every day. Thank you all. Okay, join me again in thanking Maurice Parent and the storytellers for sharing their story. One of us has our own story to tell, and this is, um, you've practiced a little bit, but now we're going to use the next uh, part of our gathering today to talk about how to transform those stories into successful meetings. You've been in these meetings where we go on and on and on and on, and on. we tell the stories, the stories going on, we never get to the ask, right? And so we want to talk about how we want to structure that in a way, because we have a short amount of time to use those stories as a, a launching pad to the questions that you want to engage the legislators on. And so to do that, we have a group of um, people to demonstrate for us. And I'd like for you to join me in welcoming to the stage Representative Mary Keith of Worcester and co-chair of the Cultural Caucus. Hold, please. Aaron Williams, Che Anderson, Lisa Drexage, Hank Ponhelian, and Yaffa Fain to show us how a successful meeting goes. Now, please join me. Oh, hi, Erin. Thanks for having us. We brought our Worcester contingent in today. Wow. We have Lisa Drexage. Hi. How a Worcester artist. Jay Anderson. Jay, good to see you. Thanks for coming. Hi, Juan Helen. Hi, and Yafa Fain. Yafa, good to see you. Welcome to the State House. Thank you. For some of us, this is a, a first experience, and it's such a, a gorgeous menu. We love singing in here. So. Sing, sing. Don't, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're here as part of Arts Matter Day. Mass Creative yeah. has been advocating and bringing all the creative community together for a number of years. And you have been one of our biggest champions. So we oh, just thanks. wanna give a shout out for all the great work that you've done with the Arts and Culture Caucus, being one of the co-chairs on that. And Rep Keefe has also led the charge for the Mass Cultural Council budget. Let's give a shout out for that. Yep. <laughs> yep. And most importantly, she is an artist, and she'll tell us more about that later, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, she has creativity in all her bones. So we wanted to come and share with you a little today about some of our own personal experiences awesome. in Worcester and greater Worcester area. Yeah. 
Well, some of you I know, but I know you on sort of a superficial level. So it's always great to go deeper and to figure out why you're here. That's right. Why this is important to you and uh, for me to get to know you better. So go ahead. Let's so we thought we'd do a little storytelling. Sure, sure. Okay. And Lisa is going to start us off and give us a little of her history. Uh, my name is Lisa Drexage. My day job is a project manager for the Worcester Business Development Corporation. And essentially, I work in the physical realm of infrastructure and building development and how to improve places um, on that level. Um, but through my journey in that position, I discovered that what makes a community is the people. Um, and part of what makes a community vital is the public art and the art in general that is uh, within the uh, various communities throughout the city of Worcester. Um, so I'm very thankful for your support for the Massachusetts Cultural Facilities Fund. Um, my company has benefited from that program. We received uh, a couple of grants to fit out the Worcester Pop-Up, which is a community gallery run by the Worcester Cultural Coalition, as well as a black box theater, which are really important projects to the downtown revitalization for Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, in addition, I'm an organizer from Pow Wow Worcester, um, now in our fourth year, and uh, we're very excited to keep adding to our art portfolio. We have over 115 pieces of public art. Um, we also have over 50 of those pieces on the Worcester public school system. We believe great public art should be available to any community in the city of Worcester. Um, and so, we're really um, grateful for your past support, and we'd love your support to fund the Massachusetts Cultural Council to okay. its fullest level, um, $18 million, as well as uh, to propose and support the Massachusetts Public Art Program mm -hmm. that would basically help us create, maintain, and preserve the beautiful public art that exists throughout the city of Worcester and the Commonwealth. Thank you. Oh, great, Lisa. Um, I just have to say, everything that you talked about is actually happening mostly in my district. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the 15th Worcester, it's most of downtown um, and goes across the city. So it's really exciting. I feel like it's home in terms of, you know, a lot of what's bubbling up in Worcester and creative um, excitement. So thanks for all you do and um, great to see it grow, so. Hey there, Rep. Hey, Jay. Hey. <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I know you pretty well, um, but again, I'm Che Anderson. Um, I work for the city manager in the city of Worcester, uh, doing special events permitting, uh, event programming, and other duties as assigned, I think is what most of it is. Um, you folks know what that's like. <laughs> Um, and I'm actually uh, originally from New York City, New York, so I'm one of the uh, many college students that found their way to Massachusetts and chose to call Massachusetts home now. Holy Cross, right? Holy Cross, that's where I went. Um, and so, so really excited to, to be here, and honestly, arts and culture is one of the reasons I stay here. Um, I found my passion uh, about a year and a half after graduating college in public art and finding an opportunity to work with the city through the Public Art Working Group and other exciting initiatives like that uh, led me to finding some folks like Lisa and joining the Pow Wow Worcester team to bring more public art to different communities in Worcester, not just downtown, but throughout uh, the city to some underserved populations. Um, and because of the work that you folks were able to do at the State House um, here at City, at city Hall, uh, we look to mimic some of those efforts and put more monies into funding public art initiatives, youth opportunities, youth education, and really showing that uh, Worcester, though it's the heart of central Massachusetts, uh, can be the heart and upper center of a lot of arts and culture as well. So thank Thank you for your leadership and yeah, excited thanks, to be here. Jay. Thanks, and uh, back to the city manager, I just think he's done a great job, you know, uh, in terms of seeing those opportunities. Sometimes you really have to paint the picture for people and lead them down the path. But our city manager seems to see art as really central to everything that's happening in Worcester. Um, so thanks to you as well, being part of that. So, great. I should have done that sooner. Probably. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Hank Von Hellion. Uh, I am the managing director of the Worcester Pop-Up that um, uh, Lisa mentioned earlier. I'm also an artist in Worcester. I am also one of uh, the organizers for Pow Wow Worcester. Um, I'm on a bunch of boards and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sort of art-related kind of uh, advoc advocacy sort of uh, things. But um, for me, I think that the reason why sort of art matters, the reason why the work that we do and everyone in this room does is important is 
<clears throat> because it, it, it empowers, it, it creates opportunities for artists, for entrepreneurs, for um, people in the community that really have a voice that don't have uh, necessarily a platform for that, um, and we help provide that. So through the work that I do at the Worcester Pop-Up, We've, we're about to celebrate our one year anniversary, April 13th, uh, which is also my birthday. So hey. that's, that's where I spent my, that's where I spent that, my birthday last year working. <laughs> I, you know what, just happenstance. Um, but uh, over the course of uh, the last year, we have helped to support over 120 events at this point. Um, uh, local artists, entrepreneurs, um, creative institutions, cultural institutions, educational institutions, um, we've seen over, I think at this point, over 2,500 people come through our doors specifically to come and participate in these events. Um, between our social media and our website and, and our sort of promotional efforts, we've reached close to 20,000 people wow. uh, in this short time. And so um, the fact is that this kind of work, the, the support that you and folks like yourself sort of give us matters, and it has uh, a very sort of quantifiable positive impact on the community and on city building. So I thank you. You know what I love about the pop-up is it's so democratic. Um, it's really accessible to anyone and everyone, you know? And that's awesome because I think a lot of times um, things emerge and they become only for a few people. But this is something that's really there and open and um, you really get that feeling. It's um, exciting. Exciting. It was definitely one of the, the major points that we want to sort of emphasize when we open the space is that yeah. this, uh, while we do sort of have our doors open to everyone, including organizations that have been doing this forever, um, we really wanted to target the folks that were either brand new at this or still really learning about the business of art, how to promote yourself, how to really build your brand, your business, your, your demographic. And so, thank you. I just um, committed on Facebook to an event that's coming up in April. Um, Stone Soup is having a film festival on gentrification. And, um, and that's something artists have to think about because a lot of times when we see our communities advance, we see them outpricing you know, the people that really made it a great place. So how do we do some of that as well? So it's, I was I mean, excited. It's, it's, it's particularly important in a city like Worcester where because we're going through this you know, crazy sort of right. growth spurt, right. these are issues that we have to address. Yeah. And, uh, the community is doing an amazing job of, of addressing that and, yeah. and really making themselves heard. So right. they're great. Thanks, Hank. You're Thanks. Hi there. Good morning. I'm Yafa Fain. I'm with the city's cultural development division. And to tell a little bit about my story, I moved to Worcester to attend Clark University. And something that I appreciated about that institution is their social justice orientation. Um, and what I was fortunate enough to do is intern with the city in the cultural development division and that transition into a full-time role for me. So as someone who's always been creative and invested in arts and culture and community, having the opportunity to intern and the funding that was available to participate in city governance made it possible for me to stay in Worcester and then work full-time. So I think that definitely speaks to the importance of making opportunities um, for there to be young people who are involved in the community and then develop their interest and passion for creativity. That's awesome. Are you working together? Are you together? In yes, we're all creatives embedded in City Hall. Okay, okay, great, great, great. We are very, we try to go under the radar and make a big splash. Yeah. In fact, we're <laughs> celebrating Robert Goddard, the first person to create the rocket. Yep. And so we are exploding this next year with all kinds <laughs> of a cultural activity. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a blast. There. Yes. <laughs> 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 so we just want to emphasize the fact that with leadership like yours and in our municipality and hopefully all your municipalities, people come to understand that arts aren't just nice. Yeah. They're necessary. Right. Yeah. That's right I like to art. say, um, I like to say not extra, but essential. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means all of us need to be thinking broader, and that's the Mass uh, Creative Platform mm -hmm. in conjunction with the Mass Cultural Council and the Local Cultural Council Program, the most democratic program in the country, giving every community in town monies right. uh, to allocate out five to one return. But we need to be thinking about arts in our streetscapes, in education, 
in public art, in marketing our communities, and equity, equity for all. That's really the most important mm -hmm. thing in our community today. And I hope all of your communities are looking at the lens of, well, who are we as a community and what are we striving for? We should always all be mm -hmm. reaching and learning more. And you have set the precedent for that. Would you mind telling a little bit about your own story of reaching and how you got involved sure. in your position? Um, well, I'm a graduate of Mass College of Art. And uh, yeah, and um, it's, it's interesting how strong a thread that has been in my life. I don't think I knew it at the time when I started at Mass Art. Um, I majored in printmaking. I had a wonderful education there. We, we had no gymnasium, no cafeteria, nothing like that. But our tuition was $250 a mm. semester, you know? Yeah. And everybody commuted in or found a cheap place to live, you know? Um, and things are a little different in the city now, and for, for students especially. But we, we need to think about that and how do we keep it affordable and not a risky um, thing to do, but a great thing to do to, to pursue um, the arts as a formal piece of higher education. But then it goes back to you know incorporating that into education as essential. Mm -hmm. So um, all of that. And um, to go on later on in my life, I you know was an educator in public schools and then I taught at the Worcester Art Museum. Um, I had three children of my own and I hope they think that arts are pretty important to them too. Um, and I was able to keep my own hand in, in terms of doing my own artwork. Um, but it, probably about 15 years ago, I joined a group of printmakers in Worcester, um, affiliated with the Blackstone Printmaking Studio mm -hmm. that Nina Fletcher had founded in, in Worcester. And it's a great place, and I'm able to do printmaking, which um, in a studio that we all share, sort of as a cooperative. Six years ago, I'm elected to the State House, and that comes from an organizing background, um, which I'm so happy to see the arts organizing around what we need, because that really doesn't happen by itself, mm -hmm. and we need to have a collective voice. So I'm at the um, State House, and I'm thinking, you know, this is really good, representing 40,000 people back in Worcester, and I was excited. But little did I know that the arts would become a real part of the reason that I'm there. Mm -hmm. And that had to also to do with a colleague of mine, um, Representative Chris Walsh, um, who is a graduate of RISD. Chris died over a year ago, um, but he really was a little bit before me and stepped out in a way that together, um, you know, kind of being surprised at both coming from an art school um, background that we had a place at the State House and a reason for being there. So that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just really happy to be working with all of you and to bring this forward. We, we really need to look at where it's going in terms of arts education. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was one of the things that I think you wanted to talk about a little bit, right? Like Arts education is top of mind for us. We're involved, as you know, in a cultural plan for the city. Right, right. And it's not an extra. It is embedded into the city's new master plan that's rolling out. Mm. And fortunately, fortunately, they haven't completed the master plan, but we've completed the cultural plan. So that's going to set the tone for the whole city yeah. and how what lens we're looking through. Great. Um, but arts education in the classroom, but out of the classroom, lifelong learning, creative connections. That's mm -hmm. really what it's about. Not the capital C of culture, capital A. It's arts engagement for all. So that's our mantra in Central Mass, and mm -hmm. that's really the mantra of Mass Creative, and I think you've helped champion that over yeah. the years. We still have work to do, though, because um, we're in the middle of Ed Reform. Many of you might have heard there's a big fight for um, Chapter 70 yes. money and increasing that. And uh, I think where I hear the arts being talked about um, is not especially in the classroom, but in after school kind of activities. So 
you know, like, okay, that sounds like a little bit of extra. We know it's essential, we'll, we'll embrace it, but we do have a lot of work to do to make sure that it's like really there throughout. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, it's part of what we need to do this now, right now, really. Um, well, we're with you on that. Yeah, yeah. And if there's anything we can do for you, something you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, oh, we got to have a yeah. dance party on the yeah. common next week <laughs> to celebrate cultural equity for all. Yeah. Just give us a ring. Well, I just think including, including everyone and uh, making sure that folks know what's happening. Um, at the State House, I'd say we just need to stand together. I'm really excited about um, Paul McMurtry, uh, mm -hmm. Rep McMurtry, who is now the chair of um, Arts, Culture, and Tourism, and I'm on that committee. I'm really excited about working with him. I'm excited about our um, cultural caucus and all of the members, all of my colleagues that came out and said, yes, I really need to be more closely attuned to what's happening culturally in my district, and I don't know how to do that or I don't know what's culturally happening. Can you help me understand that? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work to be done, and um, your being here today is just great. Um, are you meeting with other members of the delegation? We or? are, and uh, Che, did you wanna say anything about uh, Artists Live Workspace and connecting artists in the community there? How important that is for us? So I think that <clears throat> uh, one of the things we found in the city of Worcester specifically, as you know, is that um, arts has sort of permeated throughout the entire community. Um, and, and it's been amazing to sort of see how organic that, that's happened over time. Um, a bunch of us do work in some capacity with and for the city or city adjacent organizations. Um, but it really does start from a grassroots level, sort of all the way up. Um, you know, there, there are people in this, and I'm gonna name drop a ton of people, so audience, I'm sorry. Um, or take notes, because a lot of great things are happening in Worcester. Um, <laughs> So there, there are groups like ArtReach or Main Idea or the Creative Hub that are doing amazing things with arts education, getting our youth involved and engaged in the arts very early on. Um, some of them are working during the school day and some of them are bringing them to after school activities. Mm -hmm. So that's been amazing to see happen. Um, we have, um, we're lucky enough to have so many independent arts organizers in the city, um, much like yourself and, and other folks who've done festivals like, like Start on the Street or like the Caribbean Carnival or the Latin Festival to understand that, that culture isn't just something that happens within the arts, but also ethnic diversity and equity as well. Um, so that work's being done in the city. Uh, large C culture, if you will, organizations, the Worcester Art Museum, the Hanover Theater, um, so sort of arts and science spaces like the Ecoterium are finding new and exciting ways to get the community involved, mm -hmm. um, not just on their campus, but understanding that by being in Worcester, the city's their campus, so getting them out and about in the community, providing free accessible artwork. Um, and so that's all been great from a programming standpoint, but we're also understanding that as the city develops, um, it really is the arts that are, that are jump-starting a lot of this development. The idea that Worcester's undergoing a renaissance is something that starts with our creatives, mm -hmm. and so, we would be remiss not to have a place for them to work and play and live. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the next sort of essential step for us is figuring out how to not just let artists come in and make our neighborhoods look beautiful, but to live in those same beautiful neighborhoods at an affordable rate. Mm -hmm. um, and not just to have one other artist they know in the neighborhood, but to have a whole cohort of artists being able to live in the space and, and feel like Worcester's home. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the next sort of level for us in Worcester. And awesome. we hope that we have you. Uh, yeah. There with us, maybe yeah, it'll happen. Yeah, and I can think of other people that would like to be part of that conversation, mm -hmm. so great, great. Well, thank you for your time. We know you're going to see yeah, a bunch of people yeah. today. Good and luck with the rest of your time here, and I'll see, see you back in Worcester, right? Most definitely. Could we take a little picture with you to share with oh, the community? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to post creative? this on our Twitter and use the hashtag Creativity Connects, if that's great. all right with you? Great, great. <laughs> the first one I know what a selfie is. <laughs> there we are. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Got and scene. And that's how it's done. Join me in thanking Rep Representative Keith, Aaron, Che, Lisa, Hank, and Yafa.
Okay, so now is the time where we move around a little bit, but I'm going to give you a series of instructions before you uh, move, so bear with me. We want you to meet up with other folks um, here from your district so you can prep for your meetings with your legislators. We're going to do this in a couple of steps, so sit tight. We'll spend about 20 minutes in the groups when we move there, but I want everyone to take a look at your name tag. At the back of your name tag, there should be a, a group number that tells you the Senate group you're in. Some of you have two group numbers, one for where you live and perhaps one for um, where you work. You should choose which group you want to go to, but please note that for um, representatives that are farther outside of Boston, they have fewer folks, so you might want to sort of spread the wealth uh, there. After you meet with your Senate group, find others in your group with the same representative and plan your meetings together. Now I want you to see where your captains are, and your captains are holy, holding numbers. Um, so when it's time to move, you'll go to those numbers. Now all of our captains should raise their flags or their banners high. Not everyone has them. And if you're in the balcony and you can't see, you should make your way down, down here. There's 12, 11, 13, 31 on this side. I see 2 and 5 and 18. There's 3 in the middle. And for those groups, if you'll just bear with me for one more second, those groups who are in 3 and 4, those will meet on the stage afterwards, okay? And the curtain will rise, the curtain will rise. All groups, at this moment, if you've identified your group number, you should find your way there pretty quickly. And we'll spend about 20 minutes, I'll give you a 10 minute warning. And if you would kindly take all your belongings with you because we will dismiss to the march from our groups. Is everybody clear? Yes. <laughs> 